You're, You're listening, listening to Garibaldi, Garibaldi Red, Red, a Nottingham, Nottingham Forest, Forest podcast, podcast brought to you by Nottingham Live. Live. Hello, welcome to Garibaldi Red. Nottingham Forest have an away goal, an away clean sheet and an away win as they climb out of the Premier League relegation zone with a 1-0 win at Southampton. And joining me to discuss an Elite 3 points is an Elite 3 man panel, starting first of all with Reds legend Gary Bertels. You were there commentating last night. Gary, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. A bit tired. Didn't get back to about quarter past two this morning, but uh, well worth it. Well, when I WhatsApp you this morning, it said last seen at 7.30, so you must have been up bright and early. Yeah, I was, uh, I was up about quarter seven. So. Heroic, heroic. Uh, second guest today, uh, retaining his place for about the fifth podcast in a row because he's in good form, is Michael Temple. Temps, how are you? I'm definitely bottom of the bill here, Matt, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Don't do yourself down. <laughs> Supporting cast. <laughs> no, no, and a late addition to the podcast because you wanted to talk about a win after. Uh, well, I think you've only done defeats all season, Fletch. Uh, how are you doing? And have you warmed up from the live podcast yet? I felt like the propaganda propaganda minister for Nottingham Forest FC, so I thought it was only right and proper, and I get to reflect on a victory. And I can't believe it took Gaz that long to get back from Southampton. <laughs> he clearly wasn't driving, otherwise he would have been home for half past eleven. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Right. Uh, well, we'll start with Gary because, uh, yeah, as we say, you commentated on the game. We'll get into the performance as we go along. But is it one of those where the results all that matters and it's done wonders for Forrest getting him out of the relegation zone? Of course it is. You know, hundred percent. I mean, people were saying it's a must get must win game for both teams. I'm not so sure that was quite right. Uh, it's still early days. Nobody was cut adrift, so uh, there was still plenty to play for. But it started very nervy. Both teams, you could see, were right on the edge and. They were giving the ball away cheaply, silly challenges going in. But when it settled down, Forrest, I thought, in the first half were by far the better side and uh, could and should have been uh, probably more than one up. What about you, Fletch? Where do you put the balance between Forrest being pretty good, Southampton being terrible? What kind of performance levels did we really see, do you think? I don't think when you've got a game like that, you ever really get a classic anyway because there's too much pressure. I mean, those Southampton, I was amazed. When I saw the Southampton team last night, they've got an 18-year-old, two 20-year-olds and a 21-year-old. And I know there is this adage that players play without fear. Well, they do, young players, until they go a goal down at home in a situation like that. And then they got the weight of the world on their shoulders. And I thought the team selection last night from Nathan Jones was strange. I didn't ever expect it to be a game where people go, oh, wasn't that brilliant? But I think it, it was further evidence last night that Forrest are now looking a lot more like they did last season. As a counter-attacking team, they look like they've got their mojo back. Awani and Johnson last night were a nightmare for the Southampton defence because they were direct, they ran at them, they were strong. They did everything that you want to see them do. There was a bit of Keenan Davis last night in Taiwo Awani, the way he went about his game. And I think what we've got to be really aware of is that Steve Cooper's been a very flexible manager this season because he likes to play with a back three, he likes to play with wing backs, and they recruited for Forrest to play that system. But he was bright enough to realise that with the people he got, ultimately, a back four was the way to go. Three in midfield and then do what you like at the top end of the pitch. He's been very good this season at knowing when to take players out, and he's been superb at knowing when to put players back in. And when you look at his first choice back five, and I include the goalkeeper in that, Henderson, Aurier, Lodi, Worrell, Bolly. The last four matches that they've played together, they've conceded one goal. That was against Chelsea and that had an element of fluke about it, the way it came back off the bar. Clean sheet against Tottenham, clean sheet against Crystal Palace, clean sheet last night. And they've gone from a team that conceded 20 goals in an eight-game period when they lost six and drew two, to now they've gone into a nine-game period where they've only conceded 12 goals, eight of those against Arsenal and Man United away. And I think now you started to see a team built on pretty solid foundations, good on the counter-attack. And I think if you're looking for a team that's improved in the bottom eight, they've improved more than anybody else. There's a maturity about them in the flesh a little bit now. You're know, maturing together. They know what each other want, what each other needs. And I, I, I agree with you on the Southampton's team selection. I did them at uh, Fulham on uh, Saturday and they didn't do bad. You know, they were just two stupid goals they gave away a game. But that team they played against Fulham looked, I thought, OK. And then when we saw the team sheet last night, I was absolutely gobsmacked uh, that he changed it as drastically as he had. Are you 
seeing those foundations now, Temps, because uh, Fletch mentions, you know, that you that, that defensive solidity. Southampton looked like Forrest did a few weeks ago to me or a few months ago, kind of nervous at the back, making errors. Uh, Forrest hopefully found that formula and that solid foundation now to build on. I think that is the foundation, but that was the team that he selected. That back four first came together in a rotated squad for the cup match against Spurs when he was looking to rest players. And, and as Fletch said, they found a performance, a way of playing and a result in the game, which made them impossible to, to drop. Because Bolly is far from the best footballer in this league. But you'd have him in your side, rear guard action, wouldn't you, when, when headers and tackles are all that matter in a game where the result matters so much more than the performance. And I think he's probably picking up a few fans after a really rocky debut because that spell he's had on the side now, he's been an absolute rock at the heart of that defence, hasn't done anything beyond headers and tackles. He'll never be a distributor. He'll never be a ball-playing defender. But that back five is an absolute backbone now. I think there'll be an element of rotation in these cup games to come, but don't be surprised to see that, that back five back out for Leicester. Well, it's the first time this season he's picked the same team, isn't it, twice on the trot. So... Um... That, that tells you a story that he's got now, I think, uh, the right team in his own mind that he wants to put out there to start. And it's interesting the way he plays one year, you know, starts him on the left-hand side, then he gets him through the, the centre and he causes havoc. I just love watching him play. He just backs into defenders, just makes it difficult for them. He's just a handful, a massive handful. He bullied his man last night. The defender, the defender came off because he was physically bullied, lost a duel against Taiwan and E, but it was relatively innocuous. And that was it. Good night, Vienna. Night ruined, match ruined, their rhythm ruined. And whatever side it was that they picked, it certainly wasn't part of the plan to, to drag Taiwan's marker off on, on 35 minutes. So, yeah, fair play to him too. Sorry, Fletch. I've got to put a slight caveat in. And again, Gary mentioned the maturity of, of, of the team now. that They're starting to get a little bit more streetwise at Premier League level, which, which, which takes a few games to do. The first half against Chelsea on Sunday is the first time that I was absolutely against what I saw. I looked at it and I thought, what is happening here? You've got a Chelsea team with no confidence. Chelsea team with no real attacking threat. I know they've got players on paper that provide it, but on the pitch, it's not happening. And to sit back and take it the way they did for 45 minutes, I thought, here we go. Because it was only because Chelsea weren't very good that they were 1-0 down at half-time. The proper Premier League team playing with confidence that day would have picked them apart because they were so passive. And I, I was sat with my boy watching the game and I was quite vocal about it at half-time. I said, they've got to be more... You can't play like that. You can't play in the Premier League with that passive and give centre-backs like Thiago Silva all that time to, to wander 10 yards into your own half before he even thinks about having a pass it. You're going to concede goal. I thought the way they came out in the second half, Whatever Steve said to them at half time, whatever they internalized and, and worked out, was a real sign that this is a, a genuinely improving squad because they were able to fix something that was broken in the first half, fix it effectively, and then take a, a Champions League club apart in many ways in the second half without getting the reward of more goals. And I went from being worried to death about them at half time to hugely impressed by them at full time based on how they'd gone about fixing the problem, which then led me to be really confident going to Southampton last night because I thought, well, if you can fix it against Chelsea and do what you do, a team lacking confidence at home under pressure, you're going to be fine. And they went and got the win. So I thought that that 15-minute half-time against Chelsea on Sunday might ultimately turn out to be a real big turning point in Forest season moving forward. How do you think, Gary, Steve Cooper, he's going to be breaking down the game is going to be more analytical than the fans are. How do you think he would have been walking away from St Mary's? Would he just be happy with the result like we are or would he want to see a lot more in terms of the performance going forwards? Well, he's that professional that he will pick apart the things that he, he wasn't happy with. Uh, I think at times in midfield, we're a bit sloppy. We gave the ball away far too easy and better teams might just have punished us for that. Um, Freuler got caught in possession and got got himself booked and then he did exactly the same in the second half in a bad area so just little things like that you've got to cut out there's nothing really big you can say well that was bad that was bad I just thought you know the marshalling at the back was good I thought Joe Worrell was tremendous along with Bolly um, you know you've got very very good options going forward on both flanks there's always somebody available I think in the final thirds just where I'd, I'd like to see a little bit of improvement in the quality of the ball that's played into the box. 
And I think it needs to come in earlier at times because the more more touches you take, the defenders will close you down. Defenders hate nothing more than a ball coming across the face of the goal early because it puts them under pressure. You know, you saw the one from Southampton that Bolly, you know, sort of sliced behind for a corner. That's what it does to defenders when you put things in early. But it's only little things. You know, if you can improve on those little things, things will only get better. And another clean sheet. Yes, it's against the bottom team. Doesn't matter. It's a clean sheet. You know, the, the score says Southampton nil, Nottingham Forest one. Job done. Three points up to 15th. It's only a minor thing as well. But one of the players I feel is under the microscope more than anybody else at the minute for some mad reason is Brennan Johnson who's a baby in football terms, let alone Premier League terms, wonderfully talented kid, great attitude, physically prepared for, for what he's got to do. But he's got to, he's got to learn to play in the Premier League. It's a process because of his age, experience, a process. Criticised on Sunday for not squaring the ball to our knee, which he could have done earlier. And if he had done, he might have had a tap in. Did it last night. And last night, yeah. Brennan Johnson looked like Brennan Johnson. Got the ball out of his feet early, pushed it past the fullback, was direct. He's a nightmare for any defender in the Premier League, apart from the absolute elite when he plays like that. And I thought, again, it was a sign of his maturation last night that he'd obviously gone away and, and had to think about what happened at the weekend and, and how he's been going about it. And last night, he played with a lot more confidence. He made the right decisions at the right time. And I thought he was outstanding last night. Hmm. Do we see that attempts in terms of a player who, I, like to Fletcher, says, I don't think he's going to really kill off the Liverpool, well, Liverpool, anyone will kill off Liverpool this season, a, a Man City or a Newcastle or an Arsenal right now, but against the teams in the bottom half with that raw pace and slightly better decision-making, there's an, an emerging player slowly, do you think? I'm excited about Brennan. Dominated the Championship last year. He was excellent in League One too, wasn't he? And this is a lad that Chris Hooton thought, what, 18 months ago, 12 months ago, wasn't ready for the Championship. He proved he was more than ready for the Championship. And now you've seen him grow into the Premier League. I think the pace... And the attacking threat has, has always been there. The decisions will come with maturity. But what you saw last night as well was that leading from the front, pressing at the right time, passing defenders, proving he's still got energy in the last, last 10 minutes as well. And others took a cue from that. The mistake that led to the goal was forced by Taiwo and E. But Brennan had forced similar mistakes a couple of phases before that as well. I just think he was really, really busy. He affected the game. If there is a criticism of him, it's been off the ball at times. He's drifted out the game and perhaps waited for it. But you can see that that facet of his game has improved a lot in recent weeks. And I was interested to hear Cooper, after the weekend's game, um, explain his brief to Brennan, which was make positive mistakes. I don't mind if you get tackled trying something in the final third, but make mistakes in the right area because that's how he's going to learn. And in two, three, four years' time, he's going to be a very accomplished Premier League player and hopefully still with us. Guys, just well, to well, well, that, let me just pick up on a point that Thames made there. He made the point about out of possession sometimes. I know there's been a move within the dressing room that they felt early in the season that Brennan Johnson was doing that much chasing to full-backs and centre-backs. When the game opened up in the last 20 minutes, he was shattered because he'd done all of his work out of possession. And there's been a real move to try and alter the way that he plays so he conserves that energy so that when the game does come to Forest, they've got a fully fit and firing and, 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 and fresh Brennan Johnson. So I don't think he's, he's required the way they are at the minute to be just doing doggies from centre back to right back or centre back to left back all the way through the, the match. And then he's literally out on his feet. And when the game does come to Forest with 20 minutes to go, he's not a threat on the counter because his pace has gone because he's shattered because he's not a machine. So I think that's a little tweak that the manager and the coaching staff have made in the way that he goes about managing his game that is probably the reason why he's not running around like a blue-ass fly at the top end of the pitch all the time because they want him to be more of a factor when the game comes to them, which it tends to do as the game opens up in the second half. So I think that is a, a little tweak that they've made with the hope that it makes him more effective over 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, I said in commentary last night, you know, people forget how old he is and, you know, how quickly he's come to where he is at the moment and, you know, how good he was. But the step up to the Premier League is massive, let me tell you. Um, you know, people may, may not think it, but it is. And it takes acclimatisation. You know, you see play, uh, great players who've come across like Bergkamp, Thierry Henry. They didn't, you know, acclimatise to the Premier League straight away. It takes time because it's one of the fastest, most frenetic, you know, football 
uh, league, uh, leagues in world football. Um, the one thing that you know, I, th I thought last night, he got himself booked, um, a silly foul, and after that, he was having to go at the referee, you know, two or three times. I'm thinking, you know, calm down or somebody come to him and say, you know, just leave it because, uh, you know, the manager will bring him off because, you know, one more bad challenge or one silly challenge or another, you know, go at the referee and he could have been off. But again, it's little things. It's a, it's a learning curve and he's learning very quickly. Well, like Fletch said, from the one he should have squared against Chelsea this time, I think his first two touches put him further wide than he wanted to last night. But he, he thought about it. The process was there and he thought, right, OK, I can see him in the corner of my eye. It's going across the face of the goal. And you've got to give him huge credit for that because it would have been easy to panic because he was in a similar position against Chelsea. And he, he changed what he did. And you yeah. can only praise him for doing that. You've got to think as well, we're all praising Alexander Mitrovic for, for what he's done for Fulham this season. How many tours of the Premier League has he had before he's understood the process of scoring goals at that level? All the questions in the summer was, well, can Mitrovic score goals? Because he's never done it before. And he can, but he's had to develop that. He's always scored goals at international level for Serbia, one in two or a little bit better than that. But it's taken him two or three goals in the Premier League before the pennies dropped. And I think if you've got a young lad who's not living right and he's not dedicated and he's not a good trainer, the attitude's not great, you can start to worry. But he ticks every box in that regard. He's a model professional, works ridiculously hard on his game. Manager's got a load of faith in him because he's dedicated to what he's trying to do. If you put talent and dedication together, eventually it's going to pay off and you're going to have a hell of a footballer. It's just a process because of his age and experience. I just wanted to ask you about uh, Taiwo, Gary. Uh, do you think playing from the left has suited him a little bit? It's not a, a position that we'd have flagged, but Cooper's obviously seen something there. Is it something that's taken a bit of pressure off him of having to be that physical battering ram that he can drift out wide and he's actually winning more physical battles now because of it? Yeah, I think his willingness to get in the channels as well is, uh, is you know, admirable. I, he, he'll come towards the ball, he'll head it, he'll go the other way. He makes it difficult. He's not a one-trick pony by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, we talked about the West Ham goal he scored. You know, it was a fluke. But you have to be there to, to have a fluke. And he has that knack of being in the right place at the right time if the service is good for him. If the service keeps being as good, then you'll see him score more goals. And his fitness levels are improving as well. You know, he's been coming off uh, later in games uh, one, or two, one or two times. But... As a threat, he's he, ask any centre half what they hate most. They hate strikers who back into them, make it difficult, manhandle them. You know, it's they hate defending against pit players like him. And he can only get better; he'll only improve. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh, he got injured last night by the look of it. Just got to hope that uh, maybe it's not as as bad uh, as you know people might have thought. I don't know. Uh, but the two cup games coming up. Uh, gives him time to have a little bit of a rest and get himself, if he is injured, you know, back into contention again. Just before we go on to uh, a one year's injury and, you know, Sorridge and all the subs that came, I just wanted to ask about the midfield last night. Temps, what was your take on it? I mean, we were, I was very fulsome in the praise them against Chelsea. I actually don't think they were very good last night in a lot of areas in terms of quality on the ball. Was it just one of those nights where it's going to be like that, like Fletcher at the start, it's not going to be a classic? There was a lack of precision on the ball, wasn't there? I wouldn't just put that into the midfield three. I think both teams were very wasteful, took some time settling into the game, particularly in that first 25 minutes, despite the clear-cut chance that, that each team had. So lack of um, precision. But I think the physicality from those three was really important last night. Yatesy getting kicked in the head again, which he seems to make a, a habit of, doesn't he? Just just such a brave player, becoming a, a real leader by example in this in this side. Um, Froiler, unspectacular, but everywhere that he needed to be, he doesn't go wandering and he still finds a way to run 14, 15 K a game without seemingly chasing shadows and always being in that, in that central position. I think, um, Mangala, not his most complete performance last night, but we didn't need those three to take risks, particularly when we took the lead, we needed them to screen our back four interrupt what Southampton were trying to build and just make sure they kept playing in front of us, which they, they did. And Southampton's performance was extremely ineffective, but it was because of our spoiling tactics, because we had three pretty physical, hard-running, high-energy, brave central midfielders that didn't have the best of times on the ball, but I thought off it, they kept the shape magnificently, 
protected the back four really well. And on a night where all that mattered was the result, they were a big part of that. But yes, if you were to be critical, they were quite <laughs> wasteful with the ball. They turned over possession um, quite, quite, quite regularly, particularly in the, in, in the first half. But they, they, they got the, the job done and didn't wander from their primary task, which was just screening the, that back four and keeping Southampton at bay. I, I think there's, there's, there's one thing with, with that midfield at the minute that I wouldn't say it concerns me, but I think it's a, it's a little bit of a square peg in a round hole. And that is that the strength of Aurel Mangala is with the ball. And I think when Forrest haven't got the ball, he's not as effective as Czech Kuyate. He's not as... He doesn't get around the pitch like Czech Kuyate. He's not that... He can be a little bit of a physical enforcer in there when he wants to be Czech. We saw it primarily against Liverpool, but, it, but he's an important player in doing that. I think Arel's skill set is with the ball. And I think now they've got two ball players in there in Freuler and, and, and Mangala. And I think his challenge, if he's going to play that position the rest of the way, is to become better for Forrest without the ball. And I, I wonder, over the course of this January, with Kiate out for an extended period, whether they try and sign one more similar to him. Because if you think about it, they brought Cole back on at the weekend against Chelsea. They did it again last night. But really, at this stage of Jack's career, you don't really want to be putting Cole back into that situation. So I, it wouldn't surprise me with Kiate out if they try and find one that's a bit more similar to him than Mangala. I, I still think that it's a toss-up between Mangala and Freuler in the six, just because of what he does with the ball. But without it, against the better teams, I'm not necessarily sure how effective he's going to be doing that. I'm not sure he's that good without well, it. Well, Freuley, going back to Freuley, you don't win the amount of caps he's won for his country if you don't, you know, you're an average player. I think people sometimes reflect on his performance by yes, he's not been spectacular. Yes, he's not picking a you know seventy yard crossfield pass, but what he does do, he breaks up play really well. You know, he gets his foot in, he makes it you know difficult. He does the easy thing after that, and like I say, you don't play for your country that many times if you know you're just an average player. So, again, it's the Premier League. You know, Premier League's difficult. It really is. It's, it's so much faster than any of the other leagues and it's so much more physical. And it, it takes a lot of adapting to, to get used to that. And I, you can see that Forest team are adapting at the moment. They, they're getting what Steve Cooper wants them to do as, a, 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 as an eleven, not as individuals. You sort that out yourself. But as a team unit, you know, you, you can see there is total improvement there. And, and that's got to be down to him and the coaching staff. You've got to give them great credit for how they've moved it on. And everybody said at one point, oh, they're going straight back down. Now people are saying, hold on a minute. You know, and that's down to Steve Cooper and that's down to his, his coaching staff and the players taking it on board, which they have to. If they don't take it on board, then you're wasting your time a little bit. But uh, no, the, the picture is improving and uh, it, it's a good thing to see. Hmm. I suppose, Fletch, my, am I being hypercritical here? When I say that, the period in the game from about 35 minutes to about 70 minutes when the subs came on, I thought Forrest gave away a few niggly fouls. They didn't manage the game brilliantly. Against a better team, it might not go so well. Or do we just have to be kind of accepting that Forrest is going to grind out these points by hook or by crook away from home? I've watched Atletico Madrid qualify for Champions League finals by doing exactly that. Hmm. Scoring a goal, niggly fouls, break up play, make it an awful match. You've not always got to roll out there and play like a Rolls Royce for 90 minutes. There's a way to win games. I think it's an art winning games in the Premier League. It's ridiculously difficult to win away from home at the top level of any sport. It's, it's the hardest thing to do. Um, and I think, I think, I think you are being hypercritical. Yeah. I think if, if, if they didn't do that, then you would have seen the complete away performance and they won, would have won by quite a significant margin. But you've got to think what was on the minds of the players last night. They might have all played it down. And Gary made the point, look, they wouldn't have been relegated if they lost. And they're not staying up if they win. So when you put it into a vacuum like that, it is just another three points. But everybody on both sides of the ball last night knew the significance of that. Southampton are out the bottom three if they win. Forest are 15th if they win. There's momentum for you. It's, everything's on the line. And I think that was almost a game in a bubble. It was different. And I, I don't think you're always going to see that, but I think circumstances lead to that. But I don't think there's anything wrong in that. If you can go away from home and make it ugly, break the game up, be horrible, people don't like playing against you, they'll lose the concentration, they might make a mistake. 
you've not always got to go away from home and, and play like Manchester City. You can go be effective. And Forrest were effective last night. Some of those niggly fouls they gave away last night were excellent at breaking up Southampton attacks. I know it's not for the purists, but you know, you're not you're not there all the time to entertain. Sometimes you just got to go and get a job done, and that's what they did last night. The only thing that worried me with the niggly fouls were the ones that are around the 18-yard box yes. with uh, Ward Prowse. Because the, the, you know, I, I said in commentary at the Fulham, I said I bet the one thing the coach has said to his defenders: do not give free kicks away anywhere near our 18-yard box. And we gave about three or four away. Luckily, Ward Prowse, you know, didn't do as well as he did at the weekend because he is unbelievable. He's yeah. only David Beckham score more free kicks. Um, but, you know, you're right about Niggly Fowl. Sometimes you do that. Southampton were doing the same. I've never seen a game like it for quite a while when I've seen so many silly, what I call silly, stupid fouls that you don't need to give away when, you know, the opponent's facing his own goal and everything. But it, it just disrupts the game. It disrupts the pattern of play for the opposition and it can work in your favour. But you think about it, had they played the second half against Bournemouth and Fulham at home, where they were awkward and niggly and they wouldn't have lost the games. Yeah, exactly. The criticism earlier in the season was they're too open. They're trying to go and get a fourth goal, a fifth goal, a sixth goal. It's crazy. Get the result, get back on the coach and get home. And that, that's what's going to stand them in good stead. They've been too open earlier in the season. Now we're asking the question whether whether they were too niggly last night and too awkward. I mean, come on. We, we, what we've got to do is, is, is get the wins away. And to win away... You've got to be a bit rough and ready from time to time. And if you're not prepared to do that, you're going to give away goals. It, it's difficult to win away. And, and however they come, they should be celebrated. It's very rare you get a lucky win away from home. You've got to earn it. People might say, well, it looked a bit lucky, but you think about all the hard work that's got to go into win away from home. I would say to Gaz that when he won European Cups, they didn't always go away to some of these far-flung places and play like Pep's Manchester City. They would have dug in, made it ugly, pulled the odd shirt, tripped the odd fella up, threw the odd elbow, got How the dare odd you. How <laughs> dare you. you know exactly that you did that. <laughs> well, we, we had a couple of blokes called Burns and Lloyd who... Uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, Burns he used to flip them up and Lloyd used to volley them into touch. And then, <laughs> then Ian Bowyer would come and have a go. You know, we got pe people who could do that. And, you know, you alternated it, so it wasn't too obvious. But... Uh, yeah, it's, I know exactly what you mean. It's right. Sometimes the, the best teams in world football do it. You know, don't don't tell me that Manchester City don't niggle and do things like that because they do. You know, it's 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 it's, it's a given thing in professional football. You just got to do it in the right places. Um, just wanted to move us on talking about the subs and the impact they made off the bench. We mentioned Colback already there, attempts. So I thought he was good, but Surridge and Scarpa shone perhaps a, a little bit more brightly just starting on Scarpa I know there's going to be a clamour for him to start now and we can maybe discuss that later but as, as a cameo off the bench that was very promising wasn't it? Caught my eye of his range of passing actually there was that ball inside the fullback to Lodi and then a ranging pass out to, to Brennan Johnson which showed real vision and execution he certainly didn't seem in awe of the level did he? He loses a point for me for having gloves on which is, is unacceptable when it's nine degrees on the on the south coast. Yeah, if he can pass it like that, he can stick a woolly hat on for me. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe so. But there's there's definitely a starting player in there. I think he'll get his opportunity now in, in these cup games to and show he, he what can he put can do. Well, sights on as well, if you like. So if he can <laughs> do yeah. Do you know what? It. You made the point about the levels there. I mean, this is a fellow that's played in the Copa Libertadores, which is the South American Champions League. And when you think about the players that are produced from South America and come to Europe, the majority of them play in the Copa Libertadores and that's where they make their name. He's got experience of doing that. Um, I think Steve will be patient with him in Premier League terms. It wouldn't surprise me if he starts at Blackpool at the weekend. Um, but I think in Premier League terms, the big question will be the physical nature of the league he's gone into. And I don't mean in terms of, is he physically strong enough? It's, it's the grind. Gary mentioned the grind when you win away. It's a very physical league to play it. That might be where he needs a little bit of time to, 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 to settle into that, to make sure that he can play game after game. The two examples I'd give you, Bruno Gimaraes came into the Premier League at Newcastle and took to it brilliantly and was excellent from day one. Lucas Pakatar has taken more time at West Ham to do that. Now, both of them have experience of playing in other European leagues, but the physical exertions that you get in the Premier League can affect players in different ways. 
we've got to hope that Scarpa just takes to it like a duck to water and he goes in because the range of passing exceptional movement except you never saw a Southampton player near him some players have got that ability to just be in space you don't know how they've got there but they just are they're in space and every time he received the ball he got 10 yards around him to, to work out what he was going to do that's a talent it's a gift and he got that um I said last night on Twitter I, I think I'm going to enjoy watching him and I think as a football fan when you're in the Premier League and you've got a player that you say, I can't wait to watch him, I think that's going to be great. Sure, he's got a role to play at some stage. How soon it comes, I think, will be dictated by the physical nature of the league that he's in. The other thing you I like is that Valencia that. game. You know, the no, Valencia yeah, he played well. Yeah, played I well. was in Valencia and he, he, when he came on, he looked different class straight away. Yeah. Dropping his shoulder, his awareness is unbelievable. His creative, The creative element he gives you in that final third could be pivotal for Forrest going forward but like you say I think it's going to take time you can't just throw him in at the deep end because you know he, he will get found out a little bit maybe but there's pro very very promising signs and he might just be the piece in the jug jigsaw going forward that might you know just be very good for Forrest you know towards the end of the season Temps so is a winning that. team you can't just walk into them it's a winning team you don't just walk into a winning team but I think I think the other facet of his of his cameo last night was there was a willingness to run backwards. And Forrest have unearthed a few flair players in the past. Carvalho perhaps being the best recent example, who who did look good on the ball and the highlights were great. But there, there wasn't that graph that um, that twenty yard sprint when we turn over possession. And and from him last night, I saw quite a disciplined performance. He wasn't gung ho. He wasn't playing the false nine. He was dropping into the ten. But if it turned over and someone was out of position. He was a very willing runner to get back in and, and preserve that lead that we had. I thought he was he was really good, really promising signs. Let's see what he can do on a on a regular basis. I've been taking a look at him because when you get these players coming in, you then go and have a look at him because I'd not I'd not seen it. We don't get the we don't get the Brazilian league over here very often, and we don't get to see the Copa Libertadores. One thing he does, which I don't think any other Forest player does, he shoots. He'll get around the penalty area and he'll take a shot. And he did it last night when he came on, it got blocked. He hit it with a fair deal of power, but they got a lot of defenders between him and the goal. And it's amazing. I wonder, Gaz, in your career, how many goals you scored from deflections, ricochets, parries off the goalkeeper as a number nine being in that penalty area. And if you think about Forrest this season, they are loath to take a shot when they get anywhere around the box. They want to pass it wide. They want to go back again. If you've got a player who can come in with genuine power, who fancies his look from anywhere around the edge of the penalty area, good things can happen because he is a good striker of the ball and he did it a lot in Brazil. And I think that's an element to the Forest team that he will bring that they haven't necessarily had. Gibbs White does it from time to time, but I think he will do it more consistently and that might lead to more chances in situations this season that where we've passed up the opportunity to shoot. He did that in the game against Valencia, to be fair to him, when he came on. Strikes a good ball. Uh, I didn't get many deflections. All mine were pretty clean fletches. You probably... <laughs> no, I mean, what I mean is, you know, you know block, shot, shot from somebody else, block from a defender, you're in there to finish it yeah, off. It, yeah, exactly, but then it can bounce to somebody else, Ricochet there. I didn't, I didn't get many at Man United, uh, Ricochet. I didn't get many of anything. At to be fair. But, uh, yeah, he, he is. He's got that innate ability to, to just do things at the right time. And that, that, that tells you there's a player there who can do that he, he knows the time to do what he has to do you know whether like temps has said just going uh, tracking back he's he's got that work ethic that yeah gary's gone i wish sir jory would stop stop shooting i think he got a little bit carried away didn't he with that goal at the weekend and then before you know it he's trying to ram them from from all angles True. absolutely you back, pardon you're back. You disappeared for a second. Yeah, I did. Somebody's trying to phone me. <laughs> the other point I just want to make about Scarpa is, I think he adds, or Forrest have got a difference maker off the bench now. And whether it's him, if you know he starts and Johnson drops down to the bench and there's someone who can make a difference, the bench looks a little light against Chelsea. And I think a couple more additions you know, in January and Forrest will have that squad that you know is going to be important in the rest of the, the season to come. Um, Sam Surridge talking of the bench and potential January moves. Is this talk of him going, Gary, out on loan, would you keep him around or is it contingent on who comes in? I mean, he did well again off the bench last night, I thought. I'd keep him. i keep him, without a doubt. Uh, I think he offers you something totally different. He's a very honest lad. Uh, he'll run in the channels. He'll, tra he'll track back. He'll drop a little bit deeper like he did last night when he came on to help out. Um, he's good in the air. He'll hold play up. I mean, a couple of times he held play up wonderfully well and he got pulled about twice that the referee didn't give it. You know, it's ridiculous at some of the decisions you see. 
but he, he has that ability to come on and do that. And he's, a, he, I tell you what, he's a good finisher as well. When you see some of the goals he scored last season when he was playing, he did, you know, they were top quality strikes. Uh, so I, I would be very low to to let him go out. And I thought Jack, you know, did what Jack does when he came when he came on. You know, he, he gets his foot in. He's he, again, like Fletch said, he's niggly. He makes it nasty for opponents, and that's what you need at that uh, that stage of a game. Mm, true, true. Um, just quickly, there's loads and loads of people watching. So if you're liking this, do subscribe because it makes a big it's difference. It's just Matt. I mean, if, if they are going to let him go out, that would tell mm. you that they're confident they're going to bring somebody in because they've only got one kind of number nine, really, in Alan, if, if, if Surridge goes. I mean, Johnson's slightly different. So and they're talking about Dennis going as well, aren't they, Flash? Yeah, so you would yeah. suspect they've got players. And I think we should maybe hold judgment on whether we keep this one or that one, depending on who the player... Because it's a ruthless league now, isn't it? You're in the Premier League. If you can get a player that's better than the one you've got, you've got to do it. You want to build a club. That's the process they're in. I would agree with Gary wholeheartedly. If they're not going to bring another striker like him in, then you keep him because otherwise you're going to be short. But if all of a sudden they go, we're going to do this and we've got to free up some room in the squad, then I would understand it a lot more. But if well, when he gets injured, what you know what happens? That, that's the problem you've got. It's a gamble sometimes. Uh, I'm sure Steve will work it out. I mean, he's got the backing of the owner. We we know that the number of players were bought in uh, before a record break. Strikers, union, um, Strikers Union is still in there. The chairman of the board at the top corner. Look, chairman of the board, Burton Strikers Union. <laughs> You'd have 15 strikers in the squad. You excuse me. How dare you? <laughs> I was a centre half as well. Remember? <laughs> yeah, you'd have five of them and 15 strikers. But, Fletch, you, you, without strikers, you don't get anything. You, 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 strikers get paid the big bucks because they do the hardest job in the business. And in the Premier League, if you haven't got one of those sort of strikers, you're going to be in big trouble. You're going to be down down at the bottom, battling away. And you don't want to see that. No, that's the point. If they're going to let him go, they've got to bring somebody else in and maybe more than one because otherwise that could be an area of weakness. That, that, that's I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Dennis is more expendable than Surridge. And I think Fletch is right. If they are to let Sam Surridge go, because there is this niggling doubt about um, his pace from A to B over 30 metres is not quite elite level. If they're going to bring someone in that addresses that, fair enough. I think what we've seen from Scarpa, the fact that Morgan's come back from a calf injury and, and looks fit and firing, Dennis becomes expendable. And I think if there's a player that we, could, we should look to ship first, it's probably him because of that. Embarrassment of riches is the wrong phrase, but there's certainly more competition for his place than there is for, for the number nine spot. And I think yeah. the cameo from Surrey's last night was, was promising. He's never going to be the answer as an out-and-out out nine to, to fight up the table, but brilliant fella. Great goal scoring record for Forrest. Clearly got a, got a good attitude. And when you need him, he's there. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 25 minutes. He's never let Forrest down since the moment he signed. And just on Scarpa, we talk about him and what his role might be now. But, of course, Jesse Lingard's only here for one year. So, Steve, on occasions this season, has, li has, has liked to play with either three tens in a line and, and, and one of them being a false nine. He's certainly played with, with two number tens. Maybe this is a slightly more longer-term decision that they've made. And it'll be interesting to see what, what Jesse Lingard's future looks like because you've got three players now in Morgan, in Scarpa and in Jesse who can all play that position they can all pretty much play each other's position. Jesse can be a little bit more flexible because he can play wide as well. But it does make the whole makeup of the squad fascinating, doesn't it, for next season, based on how this season ultimately pays out. So they've got more options now, which can only be a good thing. I, I found Dennis, out of all the signings, probably the most frustrating because he's obviously a talented player. You spoke about him at the live podcast Fletch, he, he's done good things in his career. What's your take on him, Gary? Because I just don't think he's done a lot for Forrest. Uh, I've not seen enough of him. I don't think anybody has really since he's been here. Um, he scored all the goals for uh, Watford in a, from a wide area. So he's obviously got something um, or you, you, you would not consider signing him. And again, in the Valencia game, he scored and he, he scored a decent goal. And he looked OK when he came, you know, when he was playing. So it's difficult because as any striker will tell you or any forward player, you need to run a games to prove yourself. You can't just, you know, be Igory Piggy and you come in for one game and then miss three games and be rated on that. It's so difficult in that respect when people do that. You know, you've got to give somebody a chance of playing five or six games and saying, right, OK, I've given you a chance. You haven't really taken it. But he, he's not had that run of games. And uh, that's because people in there, you know, the manager thinks is, uh, are better than him. You want to come in, Fletch? You look like you want to come in. 
look, I think if you're going to give anybody a run of games, you've got to trust them as a player. And there's clearly no trust between the management team, the staff, and what they're going to get from him when he's on the pitch. If he starts a game, he doesn't finish it. If he comes on, he very rarely makes an impact. Um, I think for him to get five or six games in the team, <clears throat> he's got to give the manager a reason to give him five or six games in the team. I don't see the application. The mistake he made at Old Trafford was 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 an awful mistake to make. They were still in the game at that point. Make it 2-1, you might nick something. To play that pass at that stage, the way the team had been set up that night, is unforgivable. And if you're going to come in and play like a freelancer and a maverick in a team that can't operate that way, then there is no role for you. You've got to play within the fabric of the team. And everybody at the moment is playing within the fabric of the team. It's a it's a very methodical approach that Steve has as a manager. He watches a lot of film. He does a lot of analysis. The analysis team works a lot in terms of putting game plans together. You then need to rely on the 10 outfield players to carry out the plan. And if one of your cogs is going in a different direction, you've got a problem. And I'm afraid this, this is not down to ability. I don't think it's down to talent. I think this is down to application and being able to do what he's told to do when he gets on the pitch. And I think if he did more of that, he'd had half a chance of, 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 of getting a run of games. But if he's going to play off the cuff and do what he wants to do every time he goes out on the pitch, he's going to stick out like a sore thumb, which is what he is. And I don't think he's helped himself at all. Talented player, can score goals. Saw him rip Real Madrid apart in a Champions League match in the Bernabeu for Bruges. You wouldn't have thought it was the same fella. I think this is on him. And I think time's running out for him. And I think he's only got himself to blame. You can get away with that in the Championship, but you can't get away with it in the Premier League. Yeah. You know, it's a mm. total different step up. And uh, you, you watch it when he comes on. Everybody else is, Gaz, watch him when he comes on. Everybody else is doing. You can see the plan. You can see what they're trying. He comes on and he just ad libs it. And you stand there thinking, well, you can't do that. You, you cannot do that. You can if you're a great team with a maverick, but they're a team battling for their lives. Everybody's got a job to do. He's got to, it's got to be disciplined. It's got to be disciplined. I, I, I yeah, totally agree with you in that respect. And uh, But I, I know how difficult it can be when you know, you're, you're expected to do things and you don't get a run of uh, games. It's harder for a striker, I think, because, you know, the sharpness you need. He's not an out-and-out striker, but, you know, he, he did score those goals for Watford. So, he's like you said, he's obviously got ability. It's yeah. channeling it in the right directions. And if he doesn't do that, and if he's not a team player, then you can understand him being left out. As it's even more of a shame when you've got the ability that he has and you can't then harness it to be an effective part of the team. With the ability he's got, he should be a starter. That, that's the sad indictment here of his season at Forest. He's good enough to start in that team. And this, for some reason, he doesn't. And that's on him. That's not on anybody else. I suppose, Temps, you can be a flair player within a framework, can't you? Gibbs White's probably the best example. He's quality on the ball. He's, we've seen last two games what a difference he makes. But he fits the Cooper framework and he can work back. As you said, Scarpa can, hopefully. And Brennan can play within a tactical plan as well. And Dennis probably just hasn't done that yet, has he? Well, he hasn't. And the last game he started was the the 2 all, wasn't it? And after that, he came out of the side. He got dragged in that game for Taiwo. He came out of the side. We made the changes at centre-half. We had the changes up front. And pretty much everything has been rosy in the garden since that point. But Steve Cooper's not picking a team off highlights. He's picking a team off a 90-minute performance, how you are around the camp. And it, look, it all, it all adds up. It all has an influence. Ryan Yates is not the most talented, complete footballer. But he's a top fella. He works hard. He wins the 5Ks. He wins the 60 metres. You've, you've got to be on all the time. And I think what we're seeing is the sum total of Emmanuel Dennis's application around the club. Wasn't necessarily a Cooper shortlist signing. I think he was one of that, that raft that came in after the Newcastle game where the, the, the ownership decided that we needed more uh, battle-hardened recruits in their view. And I think the Dennis signing is going to prove to be a bit of a mismatch. I don't think he's got a long-term future here. I think he'll resurrect it somewhere else. He'll be a he'll be a 15 goal a season striker somewhere, but he's not the right player for us at this time. No, he feels like an MLS guy who'll bang in 35 goals over there or in you know Saudi Arabia, I think he's been linked with as well. Um just want to spend the last five minutes or so on the FA Cup versus Blackpool. Gary. A, a chance to build, you know, a, a, a winning run's a good thing, a cut run's a good thing, or are you seeing it as one where you give a few players a rest and the Premier League survival's everything? I think the Premier League survival is everything, but it's, it gives a great opportunity to players on the fringe to come in and do something to impress 
you know, Steve Cooper, without a doubt. Um, the, the run of games they've got coming up, they've got a, you know, obviously the, the Wolves game is a very important game because of where they are in the competition. You know, you're in touching distance almost and it's a winnable game. Um, but the Blackpool game, no disrespect to Blackpool, it'd be a difficult task. You know, people always say that when they go to Blackpool. But then you've got the, the Leicester game coming up. Then you've got the Bournemouth game coming up. You've got to look forward. It's all right saying one game at a time, but in certain circumstances, you have to reflect on what's best for your squad, what's best for the, the team at the moment. And I'm sure Steve will get it 100% right because the, the Leicester game and the Bournemouth game are winnable games without a doubt now with what we've seen in the last couple of games from Forest, So, yeah, something to look forward to. If we, if, if, I mean, with the players we've got, we should we should beat Blackpool, no matter who goes out there and plays. But I, I think it'll be a much-changed team, uh, a stronger team against Wolves, and then prepare for those two big league games. Mm. Is it an opportunity, in a way, Temps? We've talked about it a lot on this podcast. But is it picking teams from position of weakness? You know, the next cab off the rank is because the player in the side is playing crap. If someone goes in there and has a blinding game, a Nico Williams, someone like that, uh, it's a big opportunity and Scarper as well. It's an, a nice opportunity for Cooper and the players, isn't it, at the weekend? Some boys need games, don't they? And I think from um, the way we picked that experimental side against Spurs in the Cup and it created a back five which has emerged as our, our strongest back five and an immediate about turn in results showed the hunger of those lads that are outside of the side. So I think Nico needs a game. I think Cook and McKenna need a game. And I think Scarper needs a start. By necessity, some of the boys are going to have to double up and play quite a few minutes. Yates, he's pretty bulletproof, isn't he? I think he'll probably um, keep, in that, stay, keep his place in that midfield. But I wouldn't be surprised to see O'Brien and Colback come in, perhaps for uh, Mangala and Freuler. And you've, you've got to think Surridge will get to go up top. So my, my side, if we're playing footy manager, Hennessy, Nico Cook, McKenna, Toffolo, Yates, O'Brien, Colback, Johnson, Scarpa, Surridge. Let's just before we go. I mean, is there any player outside the eleven at the moment that you think's bubbling to you know have a big influence in the next few weeks or not? Not really. No, the, the, the positions that have really surprised me, the two fullbacks, I think have been outstanding so when they've settled in. Lottie and Orient have been fantastic. I looked at Cookeray for Chelsea at the weekend, and I take Lottie seven days out of seven based on what I saw that day. Um, Lottie started to show the kind of performances that we saw playing for Simeone in Madrid. So. I think the two fullbacks have been outstanding. No, I don't think so. Um, I'm a little bit torn on this this idea of of what we do around the cup matches. I totally agree with with, with Gary and Temps about the weekend, and I think the way we took Blackburn apart, we should be a step ahead of Blackpool, regardless of what he picks if he goes with the the fringe players that that, that, that Temps has just talked about. I would be absolutely devastated as a Forest supporter if he doesn't have a right good go against Wolves. Because the prospect of a, a League Cup semi-final over two legs takes you back mm. to, the, to the 80s, to the 90s, to the 70s. That's what we used to do. You can't waste this opportunity. You can't let Wolves come in and stick you out the cup at the quarter-final stage and give them a bit of momentum, by the way, because they're in a mess. Don't let them come and get momentum on our pitch. I think he's got to pick his best team against Wolves that night and he's got to treat it like it's a, a Premier League match. It's Tuesday, so you're not playing till the weekend. And I know it's a run of matches, but they've had six weeks off the majority of these lads. So there's no tiredness in the legs at this stage. It might come at the back end of the season, but that's going to affect a lot of clubs. And I think they've got to take that game on Tuesday night. And he's treated this cup competition seriously right the way through. I think he'll pick a really good team against Wolves, and he should do. Because I think we'll all be gutted now as fans if we don't at least get a semi-final. And the prospect of a Man United over two legs, a Man City over two legs, you know, maybe Newcastle over two. And if there's a shock result, what if you go and pull somebody else out and you get a Wembley trip out of it? You don't often get the chance to get to Wembley or get into a final of a big cup competition. They're only a couple of rounds away. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't let that chance go on Tuesday night for crying out loud. If I see the team sheet Tuesday and it's not a strong team, I'll be gutted. They might still win, but... I just think as a fan, we've got to have a right go Tuesday. We've got to make the city ground raucous. It's got to be noisy. It's got to be a really good cup tie under lights. The lads have got to get about it. And I think he's got to pick his best team. So rest them all at the weekend against Blackpool, if that's what you want to do. But please, 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 Steve, pick your best team against Wolves on, on Tuesday night. I think you will, Fletch. I'm, I'm dream. Invisible. Yeah. yeah. I want a dream, don't you, Gaz? Absolutely. <clears throat> 
Um, just lastly, then, I just wanted to go around the room quickly just to gauge where people are at in terms of Forrester out of the relegation zone now. Is this the start of the big charge? I know Greg would say it was if he was here. Or are we still feeling this is going to be a long, hard slog to get to 38 points? I think that's how I feel personally. I'm not, you know, it's going to be a battle for me still. What about you, Gary? It's the Premier League. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be difficult. You know, the bigger squads towards the end of the season, you know, might come out on top. Uh, it's about managing your players. And uh, it, what's what's the impressive thing about Forrest? I think Fletch touched on it earlier. They're the one team out that bottom half of the table who are starting to pick up and get better. You know, it was a tough start to the season. Everybody was talking about uh, the derby, the you know the points that they got, the the lowest points ever. They didn't want to see that. Well, that's gone now. And I just think you know the tide has turned a little bit, and the belief in that squad now that with what Steve wants them to do is there. It's evident. And, you know, the game plan is there. He doesn't, uh, he, he changes it now and again just to, you know, accommodate the opposition sometimes. But, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. But I think a lot of teams will start slipping down the table as well. Um, and it's going to be difficult for Southampton. It's going to be difficult for Wolves. A few teams, look at West Ham. Who'd have thought they'd have slipped right down to where they are? You know, nobody's bulletproof in the Premier League. So, yeah, a lot to look forward to, but uh, no complacency. You won't let that happen. What about you, Temps? There's a clutch of teams that look really like they're, they're in bother to me. Obviously, Forrest Lynn, are you feeling very optimistic or still worried? We're better than Southampton. I mean, if that's the if that's the yardstick, we're a, we're a far better side than Southampton. I think one of us will get dragged into trouble given the run of fixtures we've got now. But I think the reason we'll stay up is, is Steve Cooper because he adds value to every player that he works with he has a knack of making positive decisions. He's not stubborn enough to stick with things when they're obviously broken. And Mikey took a few stat, uh, stats of his on WhatsApp last night. 66 games at Forest, 34 wins. Phenomenal record. And, you know, un, unsurpassed by anybody except for, the, except for the great man, obviously. 99 goals in that period, 25 clean sheets. He's positive in the cup as well. He's took us through the, the, the nerves of playoff semis and a, and a Wembley final where so many others have, have failed. I don't think Steve Cooper will have relegation on his CV this season. I think he'll make the difference. I think there's more to come. I think we'll see new recruits, which will only improve this side. We'll see Nia Carte um, come back and, and find a place in this side. I'm more confident than ever that we'll stay up. Tim, yeah. can I just say, I'm so impressed with your homework and your stats. <laughs> so <laughs> impressive. They were, um, sent to, they were sent to me by Mikey Clark. I, I can't claim right. credit for those, but they check well, out. And Fletch it, taught and I, me. Well, Fletch taught me well. He always he always said you've got to get that right, and it's it's yeah. I still do that now, and that was from uh, the man sit, uh, sitting at home with all the uh, lovely memorabilia. <laughs> Just okay. uh, the man, the, lo- the man with the lovely memorabilia can have the last word. Um, uh, it's interesting. Cooper, when he does his post match interviews, he doesn't talk like a manager who's obviously concerned about relegation, but he's always talking about climbing the table, about improving. Uh, like Temp says, uh, it gives me so much optimism. What about you, Fletch? Last word on where we're at? If he keeps us up this year, based on the fact he was given 23 new players in the summer, he should be manager of the year because no other manager's ever come into the top flight was faced by that challenge. Um, I, I look at Crystal Palace and I look at the games they've got coming up and they've just been taken apart in their own pitch, first by Fulham and then by... Tottenham and if you look at the games they've got to play I think Crystal Palace in the next five or six weeks are going to find themselves smack bang in the middle of a relegation battle because they've got a stinker they play the top six pretty much in successive games they're in all kinds of trouble um I think from a forest perspective and I don't don't like to do that what if what if what if but there are two instances in this season that if we'd have just been a little bit more switched on the late goal we conceded at Everton from a long diagonal ball and the way they capitulated in the second half against Bournemouth. Even if we'd have maintained those points, we would be sat today level with Aston Villa and Crystal Palace. And I think a true reflection based on the form we're seeing at the moment is to compare Forest to those clubs in terms of their results and where they are at the minute, as opposed to comparing them to the teams down there at the bottom. Forest had a spell where they lost six out of eight and didn't win for eight, and the goals were going in at an alarming rate. This was at a time when they were settling down. I think we've got to judge them now based on what is more like the finished article than it was three months ago. They don't look like a relegation team. 
I, like you guys, have seen every minute of every game they've played so far this season. I've seen a gradual improvement. I've seen a gradual settling of the side. I've seen a maturation of individual players into Premier League footballers. And the top of it all is, despite the trials and tribulations they've gone through, there won't be a squad in the whole Premier League as together as they are. They love each other to death. There's a great feeling around the club. The manager's been instrumental with his staff in generating that. There was a bit of concern going into this year that it might not feel like last season because the, the lone players went and it was so good. Well, I've got news for you. It's just as good as it was last season. The players have come in. They've been integrated into the group. They all get on. They care a lot about each other. There was a telltale little thing last night. Back, I don't want to take too long. It was the back end of the game last night. Dean Henderson should have come and caught the ball and he let Willie Bolly head it. It led to a corner. And he must have apologised to Willie Bolly three times, Dean Henderson, in different, with, with a big smile on his face. And you're thinking, they get on. They care about each other. They respect each other. There's no shouting and they're at the back end of the game. They're under pressure. I'm going to have a go at you. Sorry. I'm, and he went, Willie, I'm ever, and he went, Willie, I'm ever so sorry. Like you would to, to one of your kids in the house when you'd done something wrong. It was just a nice moment. It summed up who they are. They're not going to get relegated. I've said it all season. I am going to be a wealthy man at the end of this season because Rio Ferdinand, among others, owe me a lot of money if Forrest stay in the Premier League. Because I told them from day one, I was on the WhatsApp group last night. I was WhatsApping and leaving voice messages to a lot of people who know who they are. My, my, my suggestion would be start saving. I'll take it in instalments. You may as well start paying now. This team are not getting relegated. Yeah, I can, I can remember Burns and Lloyd being very apologetic and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it though, Gaz? Yeah, did I did. Caught it, Dean. Yeah. And he was on the floor and he apologised. Then he got back to his feet and he apologised. And they're both smiling at each other. And I think if you can be right in the furnace like that in a situation, injury time, one nil up, away from home, you're getting out of the bottom three, and you can deal with a situation like that without having a shouting match, it tells you a lot about the togetherness of the group. So, And that's, that's, that's two new players, two players who weren't here last season and were fresh to the group who have gone about it in that way. I was... I was that just told me a lot about the spirit in the camp. Yeah. Fletcher's WhatsApp group's a bit more illustrious than ours, Temps. If it's got Rio Ferdinand in, <laughs> you've got <laughs> you, me, Greg, and Mikey, but that, that's how what's he rolls. A what's a WhatsApp group? What's a yeah, WhatsApp there you group? go. I'll there add you, you in, Gary. Don't worry. It's right. Event, uh, just after the calculator. <laughs> uh, we'll leave it there there's loads and loads of people watching as I said earlier if you do like this uh, if you've enjoyed this do like subscribe give us a good review on iTunes spread the word it all helps and is very much appreciated uh, thanks very much to everyone who's watched along and commented live as well also very much appreciated Temps thank you very much cheers Matt good to chat fellas Fletch thank you thank you for having me on after a victory rather than a defeat <laughs> yes yes Jonah very <laughs> <laughs> the curse is broken yeah. Gary, thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Uh, yeah, very much enjoyed it. Very much enjoyed it. We're back on Monday after the Blackpool game uh, with Greg and David Jackson for Radio Nottingham. And then after the Wolves game, I've planned ahead, you'll see, with uh, Nathan Tyson and one of the other lads. So uh, thanks very much, everyone. Have a good week and we shall see you soon. <laughs>